Good evening. Welcome to the Columbia University Alelia Bundles Community Scholars Lecture, How to Write and Publish Kids Books for Ages 0 to 12 for Writers, Illustrators, Moms, Dads, Educators, and Anyone Who Was Ever a Kid with Bundles Scholar and Literary Agent Kevin O'Connor. I'm George Calderaro, Senior Associate Director of Auditing and Community Programs at Columbia University School of Professional Studies. Um, and we are coming to you from the Forum at Columbia's Manhattanville campus. The Bundles Community Scholars lectures and programs are presented and administered by the School of Professional Studies and Office of Government and Community Affairs at Columbia. The Scholars Program was created to enable independent scholars in the community to, per to pursue their academic aspirations through access to Columbia courses and resources. This lecture series was created to provide a forum for scholars to share their work and research with the community and the greater public. If you are a resident of Upper Manhattan, interested in being a Bundles Community Scholars, Scholar, the 2024-25 application deadline is May 23rd, preceded by information sessions on April 16th and April 30th. For information on applying and the inf information sessions, go to uh, communityscholars.columbia.edu, communityscholars.columbia.edu, or just ask me. Uh, now on with the program. Kevin O'Connor has hands-on experience in a variety of media. Animation, live action, TV, toys, apparel, live shows, music, and educational apps. He's worked for Fisher Price, Vetch, Kids Bop, Barnes and Noble, and Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. As an agent, he's inked deals with Chrysler, Nestle, Intel, McDonald's, and all of the major publishers. A new project by Ziggy Marley will be coming out in the fall of 2025. His podcast, Writing Jim, What Does a Literary Agent Do?, explores what he does and how he does it. He's a Columbia College graduate and the founding director of the Center for Nonfiction, a project born out of his time as a bundle scholar. Following Kevin's lecture, he will take questions from you in the live audience using the microphone, we'll find a microphone, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, online using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens, not the chat, please, at any time. A recording of this discussion will be available to view and share on this events page on the SPS site a week from today. Finally, before I turn the mic over to Kevin, I'd like to thank him, as well as our partners at the Office of Government and Community Affairs, the Forum, and my colleagues at SPS, as well as all of you for joining us in person and online. Now, please help me welcome Kevin O'Connor. Thank you very much, George. Uh, thank you, Lydia and Peter and Brian for uh, hosting me here at the forum today. I am a very, very proud Columbia College graduate. I am a community member and um, very happy to have been a bundle scholar and it, it's actually kicked me up a notch and now I'm getting a master's at the CUNY grad school, um, grad center at 34th Street. So I didn't think that was gonna be in the cards for me, but thank you for to Columbia for, you know, uh, motivating me and keeping the education as a, as a major, um, value and um, get, getting me on the right track. So I have a couple of slides here. I talk like I can talk too fast sometimes, so tell me to slow down. There are a couple of parts that I'm gonna ask for some feedback from you about. Um, love to get your point of view on th some things. Um, uh, as a business person, I always like to start off with like the big macro level. So just, just basic, um, basic uh, census information available via your government. There are 3,335 33, 33, million people in the United States, and about 22% of them are kids zero to 17. And why that's important for publishers is that even though kids are just 22% of the overall population, they account for 31% of trade book sales. So you wanna go where the, where the water is warm, this is the place to do it. 
Um, we've done a very, very good job as a nation of telling parents and teachers um, and kids themselves that learning to read is important for their education. Um, it's a real uh, step up and um, there are many other uh, great values that come from it and it's um, reiterated in the numbers. Um, one of the secrets that make kids' books so important and special and do so well economically is um, schools and then the libraries that are attached to schools. So there are about 130,000 schools in the United States. About 90 to 95% of them have a uh, library attached to them. And there are about 20,000 individual libraries in the United States. Now just think about it. If you had every library in the United States buy your book, that's 100, 120,000 books right there. It's like you're, you're golden. You, you're already making royalties. Um, but the picture isn't all rosy. Coming out of the pandemic, we've seen some losses in terms of kids' books. Um, kids are less likely to report that they are reading for fun. They, um, uh, the sales are down overall for kids' book, about 3%. And in particular, the middle grade novel is having a lot of pressure against it. Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. One reason is Barnes & Noble isn't taking hardcover books for middle grade anymore. Um, it's been much more difficult to promote books since the pandemic to kids. Uh, and kids have a lot more things to do with their time than they did when I was a kid. Um, uh, so um, those are all definite pressures. And there's also a big de demographic change that's going on in the United States. So in about 2008, there were about 4.3 million kids born in the US. And we're down to about 3.66 million um, as of last year. So just some natural changes in the demographics goes up and goes down, but that is definitely impacting kids' book sales. Um, as somebody who's worked in the toy industry for a long time, we talk about ages and stages um, and talking about what's developmentally appropriate at different times in a kid's life. Um, I'm going to show you how I see my local Barnes & Noble. This is how I see my local Barnes & Noble. I see it as a series of age groups. The number one way that a parent shops for a book is by age. And so the, um, the mar merchandiser and mar marketers have put it together so that it's easier for a parent to go through and find something that's like. You might experience the kids section more by format with parenting on the outside of the, the aisle picture books along a back wall, board books, which are those nice thick books that kids can gum um, right there next to, next to picture books, um, leveled readers, that's as kids are getting to be able to read on their own, they're reading lots and lots, chapter books as they get a little bit older, middle grade, and then this kind of promotional area, um, which is uh, very seasonal, there's a dads and grads moment in May and June, there's uh, Mother's Day, there's uh, the holidays, and those really drive a lot of the sales. Um, uh, kind of taking a page from Sesame Street, we try to think about all the different parts of a toy or parts of a, of a um, book and how they come together for the needs of the child. So um, I used to have a, 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 a boss at Sesame Street who would always ask, what's the gestalt? What's the gestalt of this toy? Uh, how does it all come together? So um, I'm not going to keep this up here for too long. I do will allow this. I will have this on my website, um, www.oconnor.nyc, that you can download on your own. But this is kind of how you might want to think about the different ages and formats and um, economic uh, uh, constraints that are on, the, on different kinds of books, and then how that relates a little bit to what the kids' developmental needs are. Um, I'm going to talk about two formats in particular tonight. I'm going to talk about the picture book, and I'm going to talk about the middle grade novel. Um, some of these other formats are more publisher driven, uh, and I'll have some pages in my appendix that you can download that have a little bit more information about that. And then young adult is kind of beyond me. I don't really get young adult. I'm, I kind of max out at 12. So this is where I need your help. 
Here are some covers taken from Amazon and Barnes & Noble of best-selling current picture books. What do you see? Go ahead, please. That's awesome, that's awesome. And probably developmentally appropriate for a kid who's growing and wondering what it's like to be big. Any other? Please go ahead. So very much focusing the, ch the child's eyes on one or two characters, not a lot of clutter, and usually even the characters put, pulled up in front so the, the, it's clear what's the background and what's the foreground. You can see here, they actually use muted tones so that the bad seed pops. That's great. Any other observations? Bright inviting, cartoonish colors. Bright colors, cartoonish almost. A lot, lot of explanation points, a lot of excitement. big titles, you can read across a room. Part of that is for um, merchandising on a website. Like if it, when it gets shrunk down on a website, it's really hard to tell what it is. So you wanna make sure that there's a big graphic element and that the, um, and that the title is really big. It's cute. it's cute? Cute, what makes it cute? So younger looking characters, kind of the big eyes are usually what's called out is something that makes it cute, very simple lines. Um, what I see here is I see a lot of humor. Um, I see some transgressive um, projects, like I need a new butt, that's gonna crack kids up. Um, I see dinosaurs and bedtime, which completely developmentally appropriate, the number one way that any family uses a picture book is at nighttime. So getting the child ready for sleep, getting them into that routine is really, really important. I see friendship. This, uh, this, the subtitle here says, A Tale of Friendship and Bravery. Um, Down a Hole, that looks like a friendship title to me as well. Um, Something Someday, also with Big, this, this chance, this sense of transition, that things are changing. Um, and also, um, just again, as we said, just one or two characters. Sometimes I get people who are like, oh, the book has 10, 20 characters in them. Like, that's a lot of characters. <laughs> um, so kind of deconstructing what the picture book is about. The primary age for a picture book is about two to four. You can go older and younger. The younger books are t kind of those board books where you kind of mash into them and you can use your teeth on them. That's really nice. Um, it's a lot about parent-child intimacy. It's a lot about routines, getting the child excited about reading and that this is something that we do together, but it's also definitely on, it's on a path towards somewhere, i.e. sleep. Um, the magic of it is read it to me again. So you get kids in this habit of like watching something again and again and again. Um, back at Sesame, they used to say that the, one of the reasons for that was that there's so few things that a child can control. One of the few things they can control is they know how this story is going to end. So it gives them a sense of, of, of agency there. Um, there's a lot of good pedagogy in here. There's imagination, there's storytelling, pre-literacy, life lessons, a lot of warms and warm fuzzies. Um, these are books that can win major awards like the Caldecott's. Also, there are major state awards like the Georgia Peach, the Texas Blue Bonnet, um, which all really, really help in the sales. One of the things that happens with um, picture books in particular is this kind of like highbrow, lowbrow thing. So there, there are books like Thomas the Tank Engine or the Sesame Street characters or Dora the Explorer that are really very, very price sensitive that are going to be like $3.99 that 
are probably have bindings that aren't really the greatest. And then you have these like really, really beautiful jacketed hardcover books that have beautiful illustrations. A couple of things that I see when I look at a picture book is that the usage dictates the length. So anything over 600 words kind of raises the eyes of, a, of an agent or an editor. Um, one as aspect of the book that is kind of like in television, we have, we have the cliffhanger. In books, we have the, term, the page term. What's going to make a child want to go deeper in? Probably the best example of that is Monster at the end of this book, where the character is telling you, please don't turn the page. So of course, the first thing I'm going to do is turn the page. Um, the diction of the book is really, really important. It's usually a strong third person or first person. It's got very limited dialogue, and this is a problem that I've had in my own writing, is that I've, I'm like, oh, it's like a play, and I, it's all dialogue, and p some people can do it. Um, the, um, that is not my hat, is actually all dialogue, as are the elephant and piggies. But mostly agents and um, editors kind of look askance at that. Um, the best way to use dialogue, the rule of thumb is, is to use for repetition. Um, uh, guess how much I love you? Etc. 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, A good rule of thumb, too, for dialogue is that you want your dialogue to be 25% or less of your overall text. So at 600 words times 25%, you do the math. Um, you can be very, very specific in a picture book, something that's quirky or weird, or tell us about a world that nobody else knew existed. Uh, one of our friends has this um, story about talking to an artist about sheep. And he's like, well, what most people don't know is sheep are actually really interesting. And this guy like gave this whole big thing about this sheep. And she's like, I want to sign you. Because like if you can come up with like why I should be interested in a sheep, like that's that's the book for me. So wild settings, unique experiences, that's all good. What's really important is that core feeling, the ability to identify with the character and what they're going through, that's going to make it universal. Um, some common problems that I see in, um, in uh, picture books is that I get manuscripts that are far too long, 1,200 words, 1,500 words. I get people telling me, well, it's really for adults, but it's a picture book, and you could merchandise it on this other table. Like, a picture book needs to be with the picture books. Barnes & Noble doesn't have that much creativity on that front. Um, it's a first in a series. Mm, that's not a turn-on for an agent or an editor here. Believe me, if the first book does well, we're gonna be begging you for more, but to set it up from the beginning as something that's commercial and merchandisable, that's not a big big turn on. Um, it hasn't, if a book has an overt moral, that it's like the Bernstein Bears or it's teaching the importance of something, like that tends not to be a great um, turn on. And probably the, the hardest thing for any ed, uh, author to hear is Rhyming is not a turn on. Rhyming is a huge turn off when it comes to agents and editors. I get very, very frequently editors telling me that the rhyming isn't perfect, so that they don't um, they they don't want to play with it, they don't want to edit it. it, it doesn't scan. So if you go back to high school and remember, there's iambic pentameter, there's dactylic tetrameters, like da 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 da. da. So Dr. Seuss is actually not iambic. It's Tetra, it's a dactylic, there's anapestic. Most of these, most of the stuff that I get tends to feel like da 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 da, da and you're just like, ah. Um, and then the rhyming, t people tend to cheat a lot in the rhyming, and that drives people crazy. Um, I've had one editor in particular tell me that they feel that rhyming sounds old fashioned. Um, and when I tell that to pr prospective clients, they all go, but Dr. Seuss. And Shel Silverstein, and I go, yeah, but you know, not on your first book. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about a middle grade novel, and I'm going to kind of, kind of come back to, to some um, some overall truths here. So, on the middle grade novel, this is for kids eight to twelve. Anyone see any anything interesting in the, in the covers? No eyeballs. One. Busy? A lot going on. 
Great. So the focus is really on the, a child and how they relate to others rather than just a single child with, with some exce exceptions here and there. More innate typefaces. So the, the graphics are really up a notch, M much more sophisticated looking. Looks, tells like a younger kid, no, hey, this is for big kids. You know, you, not until you're 10, not until you're 12 can you get into this book. Feels more dramatic. Does it make it feel like more is at stake? Yeah. Uh, they actually have like stamps of approval, like the New York Times or Times Square Book. Or that. That's great. Yeah. So a, a lot of the merchandising and marketing is about uh, establishing authent author authority, authenticity, and awards. What what third parties say about the book? You know, having the Newberry there. That's really, really important. Is that for the library? Uh, for, actually, for the consumers. It's for the, for the parents. It's like, I, I can turn off my head if like Caldecott or Newberry said it was OK, it's going to be OK. They, they feel edgy. They feel mystery. And that's conveyed in the, in the covers. So you have to dig deeper. You actually actually probably have to pick up the book and, and dive into it a little bit to really get a sense of what's going on, what's at stake. That's really great. That's great. That's great. It almost looks like a movie poster or trying to sell a movie. That there's a that there's an adventure going on, something that you'd want to dive into. Oh, that's great. So there's a there's a sense of try of the character trying to discover themselves, trying to go deeper, find out what their life is about. Eric? The characters look more human and less cartoonish, childish. So kind of what I see here is that this, these are for kids 8 to 12. You know, developmentally, they're moving from the family unit to, to the outside world. How do I fit in with, with friends? How do I fit in at school? And you see that reflected in. Um, there are mysteries and, you know, this kind of almost little rascal, the kids are the spies or the, the kids are, are detectives or um, how, how does my family fit into the, uh, the larger world? My family's so weird, the Swifts here. Um, but you also get, and the misfits, right, a sense of I'm really different. You also get some really, really tough stuff. So this is a historical novel about a, about a pandemic um, during colonial times. Um, Rex Ogle's Free Lunch, which is actually a memoir about him getting uh, free lunch in Texas as a middle grader in the 1980s. Uh, when a, a, a brown girl um, flees, which is about immigration um, by a, a Muslim girl. Um, uh, uh, Kwame Alexander's, which is actually rhyming. Uh, not rhyming, it's in, it's in prose. It's in verse. Um, which was a real breakout. Uh, and Alan Gratz, Alan Gratz did a book about refugees and now um, he has this one about climate change. So real tough stuff that kids are willing to get into, really wanna push themselves. What does it mean to be a good person? What does it mean to be good to my friends? How do I fit in? How do I do the right thing? The Wild Robot is about feeling different as well. So kind of shamelessly plugging some of my own books here. Armstrong and Charlie is a dual voice novel about two boys 
um, who are uh, in, an, in, um, in an integrated school in Laurel Canyon and about how their, their unlikely friendship um, develops. Uh, Samantha Spinner, which is just a zany, zany adventure um, about tubes and moving staircases and everything. And then Mango Delight, which is uh, by um, Kaz Hyman, who is a longtime um, ghostwriter, writer, and uh, wrote for Nickelodeon, um, which is kind of which he kind of did for his daughter Jamelia, um, uh, about a girl who gets into a um, into a drama club by accident. So these things can happen by accident. Um, so about 20 million kids are in this age group, eight to 12. The length of these books tends to be 15,000 to 50,000. Um, you, when you get to be Lemony Snicket, you can do 200 or, or Harry Potter, but you know, shorter is better. If you also look at the Lemony Snicket books, they actually gradually get longer over time, so you kind of get tricked into to reading more and more. There is a total identification with the hero of the book and the child who's reading the book. So the child who's reading the book should be the same age as the hero. So when do you read Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing? Well, when you're in fourth grade, because when you're in third grade, well, fourth graders are really big, and when you're in fifth grade, fourth graders are really, really babies. Um, that feeling of being different or special is really, really important to the middle grade novel, um, and this idea of fitting into a peer group. Um, again, the superpowers here are the teachers and librarians. The kids change, but the teachers and librarians stay the same. So if you have them advocating for you year after year, really, really important. Um, and the number one thing that any editor talks about in a kid's book is the voice and that sense of a world that you're building for them. Do I believe it? Do I care? Does it make logical sense? We just talked about the voice, we talked about the age of the character. The time frame, usually in a middle grade novel, it's one year or one summer, which kind of fits developmentally about how the kids perceive themselves and perceive time. It's about that transition from family to friends. You'll still find this sense of mystery, fantasy, heightened reality, trying to escape. Um, definitely tough stuff. What's, what's, what are some moral choices? And finding your way is important. And it, can have a first kiss. Um, some of the problems that I find in, in, um, in projects that come to me is that people say, well, it's for kids, but it's really for adults. I really like to find a project that is for a very, very specific age group and focus on that. Um, they, sometimes people tell me that it's middle grade, but it's really for older middle grade. It's for kids 13 to 15. and. As our friends at Barnes & Noble will tell you, there's no such thing. It's either going to be on the middle grade table or it's going to be on the YA table. you got to make a decision. You can't have a 15-year-old book, uh, a book for 15-year-olds that's about cutesy animals. That doesn't exist. Um, definitely having animal characters for older kids doesn't work. And there usually, there frequently is a disconnect with the vocabulary. It's either too sophisticated or too babyish. Um, and I always take a, take a lesson from Lemony Snicket, who created a really great um, conceit, which is um, a word here that me I can't even do it. But like he uses a word, and then we'll see a word here that means da 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 da. So it's a way of getting the kid to know what the word is, but also feeling like they're in on the joke. So what next? What the hell do you do next with all this? Well, I encourage you to read and to write, uh, to join a writing group, and I have some information about that. And then you got to rewrite. And then you got to write a query letter that makes me want to drop everything and read your manuscript. Um, there's a way to research agents, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then you just got to get out there and submit. So the best resource that's out there for writing groups and to find out more about formats for kids is the Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. They do a series of national and local events. They can help you find a local writing group. Um, they're really, really great. They usually do an event once or twice a year in Manhattan. Uh, Jane Friedman um, is a really great person to read about how to find an agent, what should be in a query letter, how long your query letter should be, 
How do you research an agent to find somebody that will um, be likely to be a, a good fit for you? Uh, and then these three websites are ways that you can research agents and find out what they're representing. So if somebody came to me with a romance, I'd be like, that's really awesome. I've never read a romance. I don't know the people who acquire romances. Like, I would just be totally lost. And a lot of the time, that's my, my answer to things, is like, I just don't have a good reading knowledge of a genre. I don't know science fiction, blah, 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 blah. So using a little bit of research to find out what an agent does, the other projects they've, they've uh, represented can be really, really important. All that said, there's one thing that I can leave with you tonight, is to really, really focus on characters. So the, um, the number one thing I tell my, pub my clients is, tell me a story about a character. Tell me what they want, tell me what they're willing to go to get it, and tell me what happens along the way. That is just so essential. If you stick to that, you'll be published in a moment. Um, so here's a little bit about, uh, here's some of my other projects. Um, here's my website. Um, I have an open submissions policy. I try to get back to people in 10 days. You can ask me any question you want. Um, I will send you a copy of this presentation. I'll send you the video when it's available. Um, I'll try to help in any way possible and, and steer you on the right um, path. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Kevin. That was terrific. That was great. And um, for uh, those of you who were taking pictures of every slide, that's great. But this will be posted in about a week on the web page where you found uh, this event. So we'll take uh, live questions. First, if anyone has any questions, just raise your hand and I'll come over with the mic. Front row. Uh, for the younger books, um, do you need to come with an illustrator attached to oh, it? That's a great question. So that comes up a lot. You do not need an illustrator. In fact, not having an illustrator is a plus. So, so many, there are so many great illustrators out there who aren't writers, and the editor was always looking to make that, that perfect match. Um, in fact, that's the story behind A's for Audra, is that uh, we had this manuscript that was really great by John Robert Altman, which is it's a salute to ladies of Broadway. And um, somebody, two people at the publisher had been following this guy, Peter Emmerich, who does caricatures of, of mostly divas. So they were like, this is the guy that's got to do it. And it just felt like a match made in heaven. It was a real magical moment. Um, do you have any interest in uh, historical fiction? I have a historical fiction um, middle grade book that went out of print and the publisher very kindly um, gave me the copyright, so. Um, I'd be happy to talk about it. I, I'm, I'll have an open mind. I don't know, I don't know very much about historical okay. fiction. Okay, thank you. No problems. Hey. You mentioned something about a uh, change that Barnes & Noble made in the 2000s in regards to hardcover books. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. So now I'm going to get in trouble. So th this is actually public. So the Barnes & Noble for the middle grade novel um, now takes paperbacks over hardcover books. And that makes a fundamental difference in the amount of royalties that somebody can earn. So it used to be that Barnes & Noble would buy for the entire 600 stores, you know, 3,000, 5,000 copies of a hardcover book. If you get 10% of the suggested retail price, and the suggested retail price is like $20, that's $2 a book times 5,000 units, that's you know $10,000 that you know you're gonna make. Now, if the book is gonna be $7.99 as a paperback, and you get 6% of $8, that's 48 cents times even 5,000, that's not as intriguing to a publisher or an author or an agent. Yeah, how you doing? Thank you. Do you publish mid-grade books that are in comic book form? Oh, so, so I do have some information about graphic novels. I've done a couple graphic novels. This is my appendix, so if you email me, you'll get the appendix. So I am not an expert when it comes to, to the, to the uh, middle-grade novel. Um, it, it's kind of a head-scratcher for me. Usually, 
the format looks like a, when, when you submit a middle grade novel, a graphic novel, it should look like a screenplay. You don't need to have an illustrator, but it helps. Um, usually they come out in, in um, paperback first or board, paper over board, and so the, the, the um, royalties aren't as great for a, an author or illustrator or an agent, um, but that's a huge, it's a huge market and it's growing. Um, the, the rule of thumb now is that teachers and parents and, and librarians are like, get the kids to read anything, a comic book, a graphic novel, that's all good. Hi, apologies if you touched on this. I was following along on the Zoom while rushing over here. Um, do publishers ever share categories that they're looking for, like a request for proposal of categories? I don't know, Mother's Day books or what have you. So uh, Twitter, um, which has a new name, I guess, used to have something called uh, the manuscript wish list. So sometimes people will put out like they're looking for Usually they'll say an author, this author crossed with that author, something like that. It'll be very, very specific, like vampires on the moon. Like um, in general, like any holiday is always gonna work um, because there's a way to market it. Um, th that's, that's, I can't undersell that. Like having a reason that you have to buy this book now really, really makes a big difference. Sorry, that was my bad. We have over 150 people on Zoom. Ah, okay. Sorry, how often are uh, new authors published without having any kind of social media following? All the time, all the time. That's not, that's not a, um, especially for children's authors, that's not a huge turn on. What's really gonna drive the difference is your publisher going to the American Library Association, getting in, in front of teachers, and, um, and the reviews. I have a situation when I didn't write the material, but I happened to own it uh, under work for hire agreement. And it's a bunch of writings of a very talented published author. Any chance that it can be published? Email me, we'll talk. <laughs> you, uh, you mentioned that rhyming books are kind of a bit passe now kind of the Dr. Seuss uh, style of doing things. The, ry the rhyming? Like, ry like rhyming is just yeah. kind of like something, are there other things like that which maybe all of us kind of grew up with but are not really? I think rhyming's the biggest one that comes to me. Um, that, that is like, I probably get five or six rhyming projects a week and I'm like, ah. And I've actually, pub I've actually been able to age in a couple and I am always just like crossing my fingers that I don't burn bridges with editors when I send them out because they tell me don't do it. <laughs> what about uh, parenting books? Do you ever look at those, or is that a category that's you know, popular? It's, it is popular. It's, it's, I've tried a couple. It's a completely different, it's a completely different editor. So it's not someone at a children's house, it's somebody who does psychology, self-help, advice. So they're totally different imprint, totally different place. Um, and it's got a whole different um, selling cycle. So not totally my wheelhouse, but if you email me, I'll try to help. You've used all your questions. Can I try again? <laughs> Kevin, given your background at Sesame, developing characters from multi multi platform um, and especially now a globalized multi platform environment, how are publishers approaching that where they're looking at characters that now can live in a video game, on a screen, on every sort of device, and also have a book line? Sure. So the great thing about publishers is they don't go after other uh, subsidiary rights. Like if, if a publisher offers you a deal for like television themed, themed run away, don't do that, don't do that. You should own your own rights for television and animation and toys and all that good stuff. It can happen, like Pete the Cat um, was really a really great breakout and they, the publisher then took a, additional formats 
they made in addition to, so Pete the Cat started off as songs and these pictures and they put the two together for a picture book um, and then they did um, the other formats that a publisher is better at. So I will, so these publisher driven formats are like the eight by eights which are like stapled. They tend to have far too many words in them from my point of view um, and they tend to be licensed characters. I think I do, do I have a Pete the Cat here? I don't have a Pete the Cat, but the, but Splat the Cat. So Pete the Cat, they did a leveled reader. That's really a good licensed format um, that you want a licensed character for. You don't want like a really nice bespoke character that's, um, that's, that's beautiful and illustrated. That's probably what you should be focusing on for a picture book is like something that's really re unique, like the original Olivia. Um, and then if, if somebody comes knocking on your door for the Olivia, television show, you got a good problem. I have to imagine you wouldn't be able to be too specific about this, but if there are things that like have recently come to you that just felt really fresh or inspiring, could you speak broadly about what kinds of things those are and what oh kinds of God. things are interesting these days? Um, there's one book that I'm outselling now that I love, but I, I, I'm not going to talk about it. What do I have coming up? Um, so I have, what do I have? Uh, let me tell you what I'm doing right now. So this book just came out. I'm never going to find it, of course. Uh, so actually, I'll talk about these books. So, um, so The Girl Who Figured It Out is by Minda Dentler. Minda is a TED speaker, and she is a triathlete. Um, she contracted polio as a child in India. Um, and came to the United States um, as a toddler and decided she wanted to run, run or race in triathlons and she figured out a way to do it. Uh, she was just on CBS this morning last week, so that was really exciting. Uh, a bucket of questions, this guy is amazing. Oh my God, Tim Fight is a um, fine artist. He takes over a room every year at Governor's Island and paints it in this really, really intricate way. And then at the end of the summer, he paints it white. Mm. It's all gone. It's just like it would, would make you cry. Um, Honey Smoke by uh, Monique Fields is um, a book about a biracial girl who's not black and she's not white, so she's looking for a word that describes her own experience. And The Courage of the Hunting Little Hummingbird, I represent the illustrator, Magali Morales, and it's just really beautiful. It's a retelling of a classic tale, um, which is amazing, amazing art. What are the most rejections that your successful books have had? Oh, I've had, so I've had books that have, I mean, 20, 20, 25, 30, and then sometimes like a year or two will go by and somebody will be like, hey, that book, did it ever sell? Because I'd be interested. I just sold a book to Knopf that I've been working on since 2016. So it can happen. You just never know when. I think um, my question was along the same lines. It's the money. So um, let's talk money. I love talking money. Yeah. <laughs> People Why? tell me all the time, like, well, I don't really care how much money it makes. And I'm like, but I do. And so do I. So I wanted to know um, in terms of self publishing or bringing the work to an agent uh, or a bookstore, uh, where might an author be most lucrative? Sure. If you have a million Twitter followers or whatever they're calling themselves these days, um, then you probably don't need a publisher. If you self-publish, it's really, really hard to get the discovery necessary to, um, to get people to buy it. And the big, the big um, outliers there are something like Fifty Shades of Grey. So I worked, some of my colleagues are here from Nook. Um, we worked on, um, on Barnes & Noble's answer to, to e-reading. Um, the e-readers, the content on e-readers tends to be very, very dirty. That's like what really sells, it, not children's books. That does not sell any books. In fact, we did, we did some research with moms and moms was like, I'm not going to give my child my nook. That's mine. This is the one thing in my life I have. My child's always in my phone. The nook is mine. And e-books, that's not a thing for kids. Um, the, the best, like the most lucrative way is definitely to find an agent and to get a major publisher involved. 
there are other ways to do it. I mean, there like uh, the um, the the women who did Elf on the Shelf, they could not get a publisher to understand. They're like, it's a toy and a book, and the publisher's like, I don't get it, and they're like, it's a toy and a book, I don't get it. Like, I can't. I used worked on this very briefly at Sesame Street, trying to do toys and books, and people would be like, I don't get it. It's not that hard. There's, there are all these reasons that you can't do that, but they figured it out. Okay. In the film industry, you know, international marketing has become, you know, foundational. Are manuscripts for books looked at for its international appeal? If they are like very fine art, uh, Caldecott winning, yes. The other countries have different sensibilities than us. If you check out the like the Bologna Book Fair, oh my God, you've never seen such beautiful books in your life. That what they have in Italy and France, like they don't want, they don't want our books. Like they don't need them. Like if it wins a Caldecott, yeah, maybe we'll take it. They also have like a totally different sensibility. Like the Gruffalo, which is an English project, doesn't make any sense in the United States. Uh, Julia Donaldson, she's huge in England, and people are like, I don't get it. Sarah, sorry. Uh, wait, Sarah. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Kevin. Uh, so what is the process like of working with you and agents? So like as a writer, you sign on with an agent, you write a book, and then what happens? So it can take <laughs> anywhere from, so the fastest I've ever sold a project is in a day to um, several years. It can just, it can, it just runs the gamut. If you get somebody who falls in love with a manuscript, they're like, I want this manuscript, and you go, that's awesome, let me let other people know, and they go, I will double your money if you take my offer today, and you go, okay, that would be a good thing to do. Um, it can take nine months is an unusual of going through, through layers of talking to different editors, trying to find that right connection, and it's really that trying to find that sensibility of finding, of someone who really cares about the manuscript as much as you do. Um, and then the contract usually takes about six weeks, sometimes even longer. And then the waiting really begins because the, for an illustrated book, if, illustrators usually have a backlog of projects they're working on. So an illustrated book, usually it will be a year before it gets illustrated. And then from the day that the, the finished illustration is done, it's another year until it's published. So it, it takes a long, long time. The, the, the Marley projects that I'm working on, when did I begin those? Uh, I mean, 2022, 2021, like a long time ago. Kevin, can you say anything about the state of nonfiction for kids? <sighs> That's a great question. So I was a huge fan of nonfiction. I did a lot in nonfiction, and, I've, and I feel like I've hit a wall with nonfiction. So while I was at Barnes & Noble, the, the buyer actually noticed this anomaly, that if you look at, like, at adult book buying patterns, about 50% of books bought by adults are fiction, and about 50 are nonfiction. But for kids, it's like 90% non, uh, fiction and 10% nonfiction. They're like, with that big of an, anom an anomaly, maybe there's an opportunity here. And so Barnes & Noble really blew out the middle grade area. There was also some changes to the Common Core, which made kids required to read more nonfiction in school. And then, I don't know what happened. I think part of it has been real, the real success of the Penguin Workshop series, Who Is, Who Was, which are low price pointed, like they're $4.99 biographies. And they're like, they perfectly solved the problem for a family of like, oh my God, my kid has a book report due tomorrow. And I haven't, we, ha we haven't done anything about it. Let's get them that book. And the book is in a format so that it's easier for the kid to read and they can digest the information and they can, they can present it. Um, so the, the middle grade biography has con completely died for me. I have a project about Paul Robeson that was really, really beautiful, hard, hard cover with pictures. It was very hard to get attention because of, the, because of that. There, there have been other beautiful middle grade novel, uh, middle grade nonfiction, um, The 50 States, which totally, which was one of my projects, which totally made sense, so much sense, is this beautiful atlas, because every third grader needs to learn their uh, state capitals. It was like, it was like, it was just the smartest project that somebody came up with. Um, not me. Um, 
I've had a lot of problems in the last couple of years with middle grade not, nonfiction. It's unfortunate. Uh, I saw you first. <laughs> Hi, Kevin. I have two questions. When it comes to picture books, which themes would you say do well and don't do well? I do most of the picture books that, so I think question is what, what do you mean do well? So in terms of what I'm able to sell, most of the projects that I've been able to sell have been very focused on identity and like how do I fit in how do I fit in with my family? How does my family fit in with the community? That's really where my sweet spot has been, which has been great. The more, the more like classical, like zany ones, I haven't really been able to find an audience for. Um, and I, I don't know why that is. Maybe there's much, there's much more competition for that. Um, you know, the any holiday always makes makes sense because it's a re, as we were talking earlier, like it's a reason to buy this book now, so you get that velocity going for a publisher. Um, Minda's book, we uh, the publisher specifically put out in March for Women's History Month because there's a reason for people to talk to her now. And I have one more question, um, also about, or I guess books in general that 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 come to you, um, if if the concept or the theme is something that you believe in or believe can do well, but the writing itself is not on par. Um, you know, do you connect the writer with a copywriter? Do you like tell, like how does that work if you b believe there's something there but the writing is just not good? Sure, um, that's a great question. Um, so I've done it a whole bunch of different ways. Sometimes I'll give edits. Um, there are some really, really amazing freelance editors out there who have worked for major publishers and now help people um, with their manuscripts. Um, that's something that the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators can help with too. And there are, um, there are other freelancing um, editor websites out there. But don't, but don't let your, be, be nervous about the manuscript. Don't let that hold you back. Uh, not so much a question. I just wanted to add to what your question about um, the historical in, in terms of reading, um, as a middle school teacher, you know, I've asked my students about their choices when it's like guided reading time, why are they choosing certain books, first person narrative or not, and I realize that relatability is so important. Um, currently, right now, I'm teaching a memoirs unit in writing and reading, and so I just introduced them to Sandra Cisneros, who's the author of House on Mango Street, and that book was published 10 years before I was born, but reading the excerpt to the kids today, they definitely connected because she writes in a language still that is palatable to them but relatable and so I realized with some of the memoirs um, they're connecting to these authors because they're writing and appealing to the things that they are concerned about and even the language feels like they are reading from a peer and not from an adult and so that's like where they want to spend a lot of their time because they're listening to us all day. <laughs> that's great thank you. Um, thank you. This has been wonderful. I was curious when you were talking a little bit about Barnes and Noble and their buying decisions now and the hardbacks. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get in so much not trouble. Not the, but it's, true, it's been interesting because I've noticed sort of a trend in the events and the things that I think a lot of us grew up with of like the splashy launch events and the midnight event and it was Harry Potter and it was Twilight and it was things where like kids were coming out with their families. But now I'm getting emails where it's like Emily Henry and the romanticy, the new thing, but it's kind of like luring the adults in instead. And is it that change that like there's aren't they aren't these lucrative hardbacks that bookstores are trying to sell to those ten to twelves or that kind of thing? Or I, I can't speak to that. So when I because when I worked there, they were still doing that. Um, I don't know to what extent that's a change by Barnes and Noble or by the publishers and what they're focused on. I do know that the YA novel. Um, for kids 15 to 18 or and and f frequently crossing over has had a harder time coming out of the pandemic too um, that's been harder to find an audience and I think it's just because we have so many other things to do with our time I mean reading takes a significant amount of attention and time to do thanks uh, I, it's an uncomfortable question but I have to ask so we live here in New York and of course you know even looking around this room, you can see like there's a multitude of culture here. Um, 
how do non-white books do at, per like these different categories? Sure. Um, so I, I think there are a couple different ways to answer that question. One is that publishing is really, really aware that it's been a predominantly white industry and it, that's a problem and it's not good. And there have been a couple different initiatives to uh, get additional editors of color and more, and just as importantly, to start people off as interns and lower level, because usually you need a lot of money to be able to, f to you know, live as an intern, right? Like that's it's not it's definitely an equity thing. In my own in my own pra in my own um, agency, like selling a. Uh, my, uh, my, the editors I work with are very, very open to um, books, multicultural books, um, books with African-American characters, like that's, there, there's a real mandate for that and there's a real acceptance for that and the, the advances are there and the, the sales are there. But with that, Kevin, um, um, with that, we, we, we discussed Briefly, once you get the book published, uh, and there was a Wall Street Journal article today that the American Library Association, Association said there were 4,240 campaigns against yeah. books because of uh, uh, racial content and also LGBT content. Can you comment on this racist, homophobic phenomenon? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it both? Is it, and, um, sure. It's not good. I'll <laughs> no, say. No, I'm going to go out on no, a limb here. I'm thinking about for, for sales. We were talking a little sure. earlier about yeah. sales. And, um, and the, so librarians are really on the front lines of so many things. They're on the front lines of immigration, of homeless youth, um, of so many social issues. The, the um, you, books have no better advocate in the United States than librarians. They are out there fighting, fighting for the for the ability to keep your reading list secret um, and not um, not be tapped into by the government. Um, we are we are good there. The you know, part of me, the cynical business person is like, well, it's got banned. That's kind of good because that's some publicity. Um, it's not good. But I, but we, one, I hope it's a moment in time that, you know, foments a bigger conversation and a bigger re, um, uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not thinking of the word, determination to, that we got to do better and we can't right. do that. And you think about campaigns like the Brooklyn Public Library's campaign to have a libra an online li national for, library for every of kid. banned books. Yeah. Do you see AI as a looming threat? That is a great question. So that, that is an awesome question because it does come up from time to time. Someone's like, it's a completely AI illustrated book. And I'm like, that's not a turn on. <laughs> so it's so hard to um, market a book. The one thing that a book, especially a book for children has is the author. That the author is a real life person and was a kid and wanted to write and they have a whole story about how they came to write this, um, and that's that touch point that you can really have with a real person and be you can talk to them afterwards and be like you know I really cared and I read that and it was really sorry I was really sorry when Charlotte died that was really horrible like you know I had that personal connection, um, so AI from a publishing point of view is not a problem because it doesn't help us at all. You know, I've been so wrong on so many things about technology. Like, I'm sure somebody will be like, oh, I can make my own stories, and that's really, that's really exciting. Although, most people who make their own stories, you know, don't, it doesn't, doesn't translate to other people. There is a craft to it. Um, even even the, um, the fad to have choose your own adventure, like, okay, you can, you can play that game a couple different ways, but it's not satisfying in the way that a, a, a well-crafted story can be. How's that for threading a needle? <laughs> um, I'm gonna take some of the many uh, online questions or try to. Some of these I think you've addressed. They ask about nonfiction books, but they also say craft books, science books. Is that a different category? I don't know. So craft books I would, would say is a different category. I wouldn't know anything to say intelligent about craft books. 
um, especially if they have like yarn or something attached to them. That's like a different p price point and it's a different, usually I would say that's probably being driven by the publisher, like Klutz, the Scholastic does some of those. Um, science books, I've tried to do some science books. I, science, um, there's some really, really beautiful books out there um, uh, about n numbers and science. P publishers would be very interested in that, I would say. Um, I think you answered this question as well, and there are two related questions, the differences between middle grade novels and chapter books, and then um, a related question, where do chapter books like Charlotte's Web, for example, belong in the children's sure. category? I have a slide for that. So I would say, so for me, uh, Charlotte's Web is not a chapter book, it is a, it is a middle grade novel, and so chapter books are are these kind of paperback $4.99 to $6.99, maybe $7.99 books that are have very, very limited vocabulary. They're like very, very key, keyed into the grade of the child and the Fontes and Pinella leveling that you, you're gonna know that. Um, if you look at the, if you, I've actually deconstructed some of these and like made a word list, like they're, they're conjugations of words, but they're not v many very unique words. They're like maybe 200 unique words. They'll have they, them, theirs, but they, most of the words will be just two or th two syllables, one or two syllables. There may be, be, in these books, maybe there are three um, words that are three syllables, one that's four syllables, one that's five syllables. So the tricky thing about a chapter book is to reverse engineer it and find out the list of words that you're trying to fig that you're trying to write to first, and figure out the theme. So you'll see that these are highly gendered because they're for kids six to eight who are kind of just discovering how they're different from other kids. So there are things that are like, oh, these are just for boys or this is just for girls. I think we can do. I think we can do better. I think we can do stuff that's different. These are some examples of the stuff that's out there now: um, friendship, humor, um, adventure. Now, Flat Stanley's like a classic. That's, that was around when I was a kid. <laughs> but it's really all about the limited uh, vocabulary. Uh, we have two related questions, and again, I think you touched a little bit on this. Is it easier or harder to be both the illustrator and the author of a children's picture book and a related question, how do you find a great illustrator if you're making your own book? Sure, so from where I sit, I would love to f work with an author who is also an illustrator, because that's like Caldecott territory. That's like, uh, um, that's frequently not the case. And the, the nice thing is if you work on the manuscript, if we work on the manuscript together and make it really beautiful and an editor wants it, they'll find the right illustrator for it. Uh, I think you answered the other question. Uh, publisher versus self-publishing. The answer is publisher, right? Right. Uh, let's see. I think you answered this as well. The most unexpected or unique aspect of a children's book manuscript that caught your attention and led you to pursue it. Uh, you touched on that with some of the I believe with the compelling yeah. ones you're, you're working on. Uh, average timeline for children's book ages two to six, you talked about a timeline. Yeah, Previously, anywhere, anywhere from it, selling it in a day to nine months, and then it usually takes, if it's just a, no, if it's just a novel, you're talking 18 months to publication, a picture book at least, at least a year, at least two years, probably more. Uh, what about books in Spanish, or maybe translating existing popular books into Spanish? Is there a need for that? That is a great question. Um, so uh, Magale Morales, who I uh, represent, she has done several of her books in Spanish, um, and they have done very well. I, I'm not, that's really a publisher question at this point. I think that, I think publishers would be very, very open to it. I don't know what the stats are about that. And then just some uh, technical advice questions. Is there a template or structure to help you organizing your writing? Um, is there um, you know, practical how-tos, um, editorial revisions? Hang on one second, let me just see if I can find one that's a little bit 
clearer than me. Um, so for a picture book, there are some templates that exist out there. I, ha I have this one in my appendix, which I can share, which is about how to do a self-closing picture book. So the um, books are always divisible by eight. Um, and that's because of the way that they're printed. So this is a 32-page picture book, um, which is going to be um, four signatures of eight. Um, they, what else can I tell you? Um, and there, there's ways to do it and how many words there should be on and which ones should have words and which ones should have, have illustrated. That's a pretty, con you'll, if you can Google that one and you can find yeah. that. Um, and then for some other ones, I send people... This. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. So Story by Robert McKee, which is a screenwriting book, but really, really helps figure out what a three-act novel should be. Save the Cat, uh, again, it's a screenwriting book, but really, really helpful. And Creating Character Arcs is really great. That is um, more for novels, but it's about how the, the wants and the needs of the different characters co co um, come into conflict with each other and, and how that moves the story forward. So it's it's not here with a thousand faces. It's much more character driven, multiple character driven. Uh, what is the suggested upper range in terms of age, grade, level, and word count for a picture book, children's book? Sure. Um, I would shoot for f ages four to eight. And I would, I say 500 or 600 words at the most. Because the number one way that somebody's trying to work with it is read it before they go to bed and you're like I don't know if it's ever happened to you that somehow pages stick together when it's getting late and then you skip a page and the kid goes you skipped a page and you're like well then reread it uh, let's see I have two more questions uh, when signing a new client are you signing a particular manuscript or are you signing the author that's great that's a great question I usually work on a manuscript by manuscript uh, basis just because who knows what can happen. Um, but most agents will work with you. I mean, most will sign you for life, and then there's ways to get out of that, but and the last which is pretty easy to do. The get last it. question you're very capable of answering. How do you find an agent again? Right, so <laughs> uh, go to these websites. The Query Tracker, Agent Query, My Manuscripts. Also take, check out Jane Friedman, because she has a lot of great... Um, insight into that. And you can also email me. I have some insight into that. I think there were a couple other questions oh, oh, from the floor. Some people know. thought of some. Uh, I, I'd like your thoughts on photographs instead of illustrations. That's a great question. Um, I, th I think photographs can really work. I have not represented somebody who's done photographs, but I think um, that can certainly work. And Mo Willems has done the hybrid. Yeah. And also, as a photographer, I wonder, like, what if I take some of my photos and you can do stuff in Photoshop where they kind of turn illustrate -y looking? I think if you're really, I think more than, I think that more than looking illustrated, somebody would be interested in a mixed media. So if you look at Gigi Morales's Viva Frida, um, that is mixed media. So she's doing acrylic. She's doing uh, handmade handmade clothes for dolls, like that would really get somebody's attention rather than taking a, a photograph and, and uh, you know, just using a filter. I would ask uh, this question. How about mystical books? Mystical books. I would say, let's see, um, I think for middle grade that can really work. Like that sense that there's a community or there's a secret that the kids are getting involved with. With picture books, I would think it would be, it would be harder. And then you'll, you'll also definitely get a whole bunch of people protesting against you, which might not be a bad thing. But like a lot of people protested against Harry Potter for the occult aspects of it. Well, I just wanted to ask about the resources. Are those hyperlinks? Like, yes. Will there be a, um, an example of an agent query letter there? That is a great question. Um, Jane Friedman might have one, but you can email me and I'll, we'll figure something out. I was kidding. Are there any more questions? In <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Hi. Um, okay. 
So my question is, not that I want to go against the recommendation um, of word count, but um, I guess my question is, should we, so there are certain books that I remember reading with like my students when I was a teacher that are like that, that word longer than like the Shrek. suggested word Shrek. count. Shrek is very, yeah. very long. So I'm like, and I, I know times change, so should we just like chuck it up to like times change or like are there certain books that just, you know, like they do well, like no matter like the word count and we should just stick to it. Like, I guess I just wanted you to speak about that. Sure. But, yeah. So the number one thing that sells a book is that it's already popular. So if you look at like the the top 100 books that sell in a year, most of them we we all know it's you know the where the wild things are. It's very hard to break a new new book into that list. Um, my my recommendation was be on your first book, make it 500 to 600 words, and then work with an editor who's like, I got your vision. I understand why this needs to be longer. The only way to tell the story is to make it longer and. We'll, we'll throw caution to the wind. I think it's too easy for an editor to say, no, that's a, we, we can't do that at the, at the beginning. Uh, I'm coming. Hi. Um, is it safe to email your manuscript without any copyright protection? That's a great question. So this is... Um, so this is what my understanding of copyright law is. By virtue of the fact that you wrote it, you own it. You can put the C in the, the, C in the circle, which tells people that you wrote it and you know it. You wrote it, you own it, and you know it. And now they know it too. Um, and then there are other things that you can do. You can send yourself a, a, self a copy of it in the mail. Usually the rule of thumb is to send two copies and sign the back and don't open them. Um, so if you have to open them in a court of law, um, I don't worry about that too much, but um, that, that, those are things that do, you can do. And then when the book finally gets published, there's a way that, you, that the publisher goes to copyright.gov and registers the copyright, which again is just saying, like, yes, we, the, the author owns it, and we're giving you notice that they own it. That's a great question. Uh, are there any subjects that teachers or librarians have told you there's a, a need for more books on, like I, dinosaurs have been done to death, but like I, I'm thinking of uh, things like marine biology or, you know. I, I don't have much experience Thank talking you. to teachers or librarians, so what do you guys think? <laughs> what, do you get, what do you need in your classrooms? Um, I personally would like more, oh sorry. Um, I personally would like to see more historical fiction. Um, I just um, introduced the Watsons Go to Birmingham. Um, and so I think uh, because we're also talking about the civil rights um, and it being historical fiction, it allows us to discuss it um, in a safe way that is palatable for them. Um, That's Christopher um, Paul. Uh, the Watsons go to Birmingham. Yeah. yeah. So um, for me, I would like to see more historical fiction um, that is still like relatable to them, but still addresses the, the topics that they do need to learn about. Um, so that's just like my personal desire um, for kids, because I'm also just not really a fan of the graphic novels. Um, just thinking about the literary text that they have to read, um, and we're thinking about like this week is the ELA state exam. Um, and just thinking about the ways that I want them to improve reading. So, you know, I, I do want to see more versatile reading. Christopher Paul Curtis, that's a, I forgot his last name. Hi, so I'm a children's librarian right down the road. Oh, good. And what do you need? What I can tell you that flies out of our shelves is um, graphic novels. Sorry. <laughs> graphic novels, and they, they read that section daily but mainly whatever the kids uh, interact with. So right now, it's anything Minecraft. So whatever the story about a little pig or a tree or, or uh, the monster, whatever the story is, they don't care. They just grab because it's Minecraft. Wow. And um, I also have a question. Can you explain ISBN? So um, when is it assigned or if it's a self-published book, do we have to buy it or how, how does that sure, work? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so that's a, I should have put on my resources, talk to a librarian. That's like, 
the librarians have their finger on the pulse of like what families are actually reading. That's really, really important. So the ISBN is the number on the back of the book that begins 978, blah, blah, blah. If you are working with a traditional publisher, they will assign that to you. If you are working with um, Kindle or Kindle Direct, Amazon, they will assign that to you. They'll assign you an ASIM, which is the Amazon number. I would say under very, if you're purely self-publishing, like if you're working with Ingram or something on a self-published -pub project, they would, they would work with you to buy one. I don't, you buy like bundles of them or because they're a, they're a publisher that they help other people self-publish, they would have access to them. Uh, oh, so once you have an ISBN, is it harder to get a publisher involved? Yes. So it's like near impossible. Like if you already publish a book and you send it to me, I'm like, I got nothing. I got nothing. Because the number one way that a publisher gets publicity for a new book is they send it out for review. And if a book's already come out, even if it's just you self-publishing it, it's very unlikely that you'll get it. You'll get a review, and that kind of makes the whole thing fizzle. Another question online, what are the common mistakes first time authors make? Well, I think we, t we talked about that A with little the bit. rhyming. Okay, and okay, good. Um, and this might be related to the banned book conversation, but what is the market like for books that center on religion? That's a good question. Will Mothers for Liberty scoop them up? Uh, there are, so HarperCollins, Simon & Schuster in particular have religious imprints, Thomas Nelson. I don't work with them very much, um, but that is a thing. Um, people do do retelling of um, the Bible stories or inspirational stories or spiritual stories. That is a real thing. All right, last. And, and, and actually in mega churches too. That can be a great way to sell books. Okay, uh, last call. All right, well with that, please help me thank Kevin O'Connor for a really <laughs> tremendous talk. Thank you.